anxiety is um, we will start off the evening with monologues from some of our Muslim, fellow Muslim students who will speak about their struggles as Muslims, both internal and external, and how Islam has made an impact on their daily, daily life. And then we'll have Dr. Kim Q talking about her journey and experiences after accepting Islam. And last but not least, we are very fortunate to have a faculty member of the UW um, Department of Anthropology, Professor Michael Perez, who will be challenging the narrow and often erroneous views of domestic and social oppression in the Muslim world, as well as delving into the common challenges faced by both genders. And with that, I'd like to introduce our first monologue speaker of tonight. She's a sophomore studying math. Please welcome Sylvia Sheikh. I'm the oppressor. I am the man they say women thinks I am the man they say thinks women are a disease. I am the man they say never touches a woman out of arrogance. I am the man they say refuses to make eye contact with a woman out of spite. I am the oppressor. I am the man they say views women as sex slaves. I am the man they thinks they say thinks women should have no rights. I am the man they say will strike out at anybody, even when slightly angry. I am the oppressor. I am the man they say should have never been allowed to stay. I am the man they say should apologize for what others have done. I am the man they say will kill everybody. I am the oppressor. I am the man who thinks women are important. I am the man who never touches a woman out of respect for her honor. I am the man who rarely looks at a woman out of modesty. I am the oppressor. I am the man who views women as integral parts of society. I am the man who fights for equal rights. I am the man who has never hit a single person in his life. I am the oppressor. I am the man who was born and raised in this country. I am the man who never did any wrong. I am the man who protests for peace. Am I the oppressor? Thank you, Thar. That was very, very nice. 
Um, now I'd like to introduce a fellow junior of ours, studying physics and astronomy, Ms. Alita Bidiari. to Islam. Uh, I've been Muslim for virtually whole, my whole life. And uh, like many people who have been growing up in any faith, uh, you just kind of go through the motions. You've been just been practicing your whole life, but you don't really know why. And so it's just a story for another time, but I basically hit a point where I had to start asking, why am I doing this? And, uh, uh, and I began to take myself and my religion a little bit more seriously. And when I did, I started noticing some of the behaviors that were very common to amongst my fellow men. Um, and they just started to irritate and disgust me. I remember, for example, one of my co-workers. Uh, he received some naked photos from his girlfriend, and he quickly and happily goes around showing all his male co-workers. And this was completely acceptable for him, for, and both for, for him and the men who were looking on. And, okay, Ahmed, don't be shaking. Um, the problem, one of the things I feel like the problem is, is that uh, that contributes to this mindset is the continued objectification and hypersexualization of our women in this society. Um, and I feel that, uh, I feel that, uh, okay, so for example, one, a physician, I was watching, watching a documentary where a physician who, who works with young girls, she was recalling how so many of her young girls who come to her would be asking this question, do I really have to take it in three holes? And I would, I'm sorry to be vulgar, I'm sorry to be explicit, but we have to be frank in this. 
I, when men view women as objects and not as sensitive human beings who have, em have their own emotions and their own desires for what they want and do not want to do, well, it's no wonder that we get girls asking questions like this. I do not think any 14-year-old girl should be asking questions like this. Now, what part, uh, one of the things that's most sad for me is how our, I feel that our society, our culture, <coughs> continues to objectify women and encourages it, in fact. Walk through any grocery store, check out the aisle, okay? And look at the magazines targeting women. Look at the covers and see the, the what is encouraged for women to wear. This idea that tight, revealing, sexy clothing is what is encouraged for them to wear. And, <coughs> sorry. And, for, and the most insidious thing for me is that they are told this is somehow freeing for them, empowering for them, while I would argue that it only enslaves women to men. Now, before I get a crowd of women up here to ready to chop off my head, please hear me out, okay? So, back in the day, if I wanted to see certain parts of a woman's body, I had to actually do something. I had to actually work for it. I had to take her out, treat her really nicely, buy her nice things, and then maybe, just maybe, I'd get it. But now all I have to do is step out my front door. What were considered the private parts are now on public display. Now, isn't it how convenient, how convenient that women are being, our young girls are being told that this empowers them, that this frees them, and me, as the man, reaps all the benefit. Young girls are doing exactly what I want them to do. They are wearing wear tight clothing, and what clothing you are wearing, wear less of it. Yeah, I think I'm the one getting all the benefit. And so, <laughs> and so, and you see, this whole style, this whole fashion, it, acts as, it only acts as an impediment to me as a man from getting to know who you really are. Okay, here's me, trying to listen and pay attention to a woman who is wearing a very tight, or low-cut top, okay? Okay, Ahmed, my name's Ahmed, by the way. Ahmed, just stare straight ahead, look forward, okay, look forward, okay, look down. Nope, look back up, okay, um, just stare straight ahead. Maybe you should try some meditative breathing. Okay, breathe in. Breathe out. Uh, okay, I think you're starting to breathe a little too heavy, buddy. Um, <laughs> you know, who knew holding a simple, everyday conversation could be so difficult? I cannot even recall a thing she said because I was trying to kind of put my full brain power into just keeping my eyes up. But when a woman who is modestly dressed, and I am not just talking about Muslim women, when a woman, Muslim or non-Muslim, comes to me and she is modestly dressed and she speaks, I can actually listen when you, she, when you speak. I can, when you speak, your personality unfolds itself in front of me, and I can, just, I, can, I can see you for who you really are, and not just as a pair of legs, a pair of breasts. Okay, and so, and me as a Muslim man, I cannot even stare or look at a woman for a long time, like so many of the other speakers have said. God says in the Quran, in this verse, God is commanding the Muslim, the Muslim man to lower his gaze, and that God is watching over him. If I cannot even look or stare at a woman for a long time, how do you think this is going to affect how I interact with women in general? How do you think I will treat them? I will treat them with the utmost respect. I have three little sisters. The standard I try to hold myself by is that I ask myself when interacting with a woman, would I be, how would I feel if a man was doing the same thing with my three little sisters? And when I ask myself this more often than not, am I comfortable? I have to say no. And I have to change the way I am speaking, maybe joke a little bit less, change the, change the direction that I'm looking. And really this gets to the crux of the issue. I feel regardless of how women dress, regardless of what the society is doing to us, we as men need to step up and treat women the way that we want the women who are closest to us in our own lives to be treated. And I feel, and I feel this is well shown by a story, and I will close with this. One of my classmates and I, we were walking out of class, he was non-Muslim, walking on campus, and he sees a girl and he says something along the lines of, oh, isn't she hot? Check her out. Okay, very typical, very normal, uh, I am used to this. But for some reason, this just set something off in me that day, and I went off on a rant with him, and I told him, that girl, that is someone's daughter, sister, 
possibly someone's girlfriend. Heck, she could be someone's wife. There are so many college age people who are married on campus, okay? If that were our daughter, my, if that were our daughter, our sister, your girlfriend, my wife, and a man was looking at her or talking about her in this manner, we would, we would be furious. What gives us the right, what gives, us the, what gives us the justification to behave like this? And you know what he told me? You're right, you're right. So this is Islam, and this is how I, as a Muslim man, am commanded to treat women. Thank you for listening. States. Raised as a Catholic, Dr. Q received religious and general education at a French convent in Saigon until the age of 15. She embraced Islam at 19, 19, 1995 sorry, at the age of 39. Please help me welcome Dr. Q. difficult lady. 
waiver. So I came out with a, a, I was born with a deformity that made me permanently, my head permanently turned to the side like that. So this is how I was growing up in Vietnam. And my parents being practical Asians, the way most mm -hmm. parents and Asian parents are, they took one look at me and they said, well, you know, the chances of girl getting married in the future is just about guilt. You know, with, with half of the men dropping off in the battlefield of Vietnam with the old faces, I mean, it's hard enough for any, the, you know, regular looking young lady to get married. So they did a very practical thing. They said, well, you know, let's send this girl off to the convent, you know. The nuns said the Vatican will take care of her for the rest of her life. She got is merciful and give her a calling. So there I was, when I went to the convent at the age of five. I stayed there until 15. I don't recall specifically having a divine calling from God. Um, I definitely remember the uh, frequent, you know, patting and beating with the ruler as, uh, from Mother Superior and from her troop of nuns. You know, for crimes that I seriously committed, like talking in class, chewing gum in class, running in the hallway, you know, in the 50s and 60s, can you imagine that's all we had to deal with in terms of problem medicates? And I think probably for this country, not just in Vietnam, that's what we all had to deal with. So then, um, at the, uh, when I was about, when I was 19, with a fall of Saigon, I did come to the U.S. And, and thank God, I mean, I, I, my, my life was pretty much a, a, a kind of like a modern Cinderella movie. Um, I, I came here and I, I was able to attend college by the way because I had a year of college in Vietnam. So I, I entered second year of college when I was 19 years old. Um, I did fairly well with all the student loans and grants that I was uh, getting. Um, my, I, my nutritional support was you know, relying on basically the uh, um, vitamin C that they put in the water down margaritas and the high caloric uh, free order that I got at uh, happy hours. Um, so I, I was just living a normal, regular college life. Um, and, then, and then I had the, the height of my life was at that time was when, when, in about, when I was 21, my brother decided that I looked kind of reliable enough, responsible enough for him to give me a hand-me-down 1972 Pinto. So I'm not, you know, I mean, only a few people in this audience remember what a Pinto looks like. You've all had to Google it. <laughs> Even Dr. Perez is too young to you know what a pinto looks like. I had no idea why my brother ch chose that car at a time before he gave it to me. And then later on I realized looking around in Southern California, that was the only type of car where you can squeeze about seven Hispanics or eight Vietnamese refugees into it. <laughs> so, um, anyway, and then um, after two years of college, I was fortunate enough, I was, uh, I, I, I applied and was admitted to the Ivy League Medical School, like John Hopkins. But unfortunately, my mother contracted brain cancer, so I decided to take one year off after college to take care of her. So I stayed home to care of her. Then when I matriculated, only one of the school, UCSD Medical School, uh, let me enter the school without having to reapply, so I decided to stay in San Diego. That's why I met my um, first husband. Uh, version number one. Uh, he, um, we, we met, we were assigned to a cadaver uh, and we worked together. So, a lot of bonding going on there. <laughs> so, I mean, so much bonding and the, you know, affection developed that I don't know, we, we ended up getting married. I mean, I, I mean, I married a guy out of the book. He was, he was white, uh, he was tall, handsome, uh, straight out from uh, Stanford, um, wealthy family. I mean, you know, anything a girl could have asked for. A dashingly handsome of you. Um, and, 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 well, but then the only thing that was a problem was that my parents, were not, I mean, my father at the time, was not very uh, excited about the whole thing. Because number one, he's not Asian, as you can imagine. And number two, I'm a Catholic, Catholic background. And he's an atheist. But you know, I mean, here I was already in America for a couple of years. I'm a liberated woman. I was going to be a doctor. I didn't really care what my father had to say. So then happily, we went, we got married. Then we went to residency in anesthesiology, and we got out and we, uh, we established ourselves at a small community in Florida. Um, so at this time, um, I was working part-time. I still earned a six-figure income. He was listed as one of the youngest, uh, highest-earning anesthesiologists, chief of anesthesia at a hospital in uh, Florida. So, I mean, we, I mean, he was at the top of his career. I mean, we had nothing to worry about. You know, you only have to call on God if you some calamity happens if you were in the dungeon, but you know, there, there was no reason for me uh, to change my faith with Catholicism or anything else, or for him to even think about that. But lo and behold, I will skip all the birds and bees, how it came from the wedding to the 
having two kids, but anyway, we did end up with two children. And I, I think maybe there was something a little bit, um, uh, I'm not sure even how to call it. I think there was something about the birth process, going through having children yourself versus reading an anesthesiology book in, in medical school. And then watching these two little ones growing up, you know, with the baby eyes batting and constantly looking up at you, asking questions. I guess maybe he was thinking, he was predicting at some point in life, in life that the kids are going to ask him, you know, okay, so, you know, he's like, he's lie up to death, you know, what is this, you know, why are we here, and what is life? And, and so he, he began to ask those questions himself. And so one day he came to me and he said, you know, when I was at Stanford, I, I, I did some, I, I, in my in Oriental um, studies, and, and, and I, I read the I Ching, but I really don't know too much. I mean, I kind of see you, you know. He, I mean, I was very good. I never forced him to become Catholic, so he was a dutiful observer on the side. He was a non-protester. Uh, he let me practice my faith. Um, but he said, you know, I, I never really formally read any scriptures, so he decided to read the um, Old Testament. Then he decided to read the Bible, and then he realized, well, you know, they're not just only my Catholic Bible, but I, and he, I, I couldn't believe I was a Catholic, but I never read the Bible cover to cover, you know, I mean, I read what the priests say and the deacons say during Sunday Masses, and, um, and I'm doing my Bible study, we may focus on one chapter or another, but my husband, Steve Brown, Steve Brown, at the time, he read cover to cover, and then he, and then he realized, no, then he had to also get to the King James Version, then the Mormon Version, then the Jehovah Witness Version. And he read all of that <laughs> from cover to cover. You know, typical OCD, high achiever kind of guy. So he did all of that and he said, well, you know, what the hell? I mean, um, I don't know anything about this religion. All we know was in 1991, um, some stupid do it went under the uh, World Trade Center and set off a bomb in his van or something. He said, you're this horrible religion. Now, he doesn't know anything about it. So he decided to read the, a translation of the coffee of the Quran while he was drinking vodka. And then, um, and then, um, you know, so, and then, so I, I was like really getting kind of worried here. And I said, well, you know, out of cursing, this guy, we should at least consider Catholicism, you know, more seriously, because out of, the crazy for me, I haven't forced him, I haven't like compelled him to convert anything, but you know, just to be keeping the family unit, he really should seriously consider this. And then he began to like, you know, trim down, <laughs> to, like eat a healthier diet, start exercising, and there's a whole lot of things he was trying to do to kind of enrich his life. And so then I was starting, my mind was starting to go off another way, you know what I mean? Well, and I thought, well, maybe he was just going through like the premature midlife crisis, you know? Did you see a guy 40, 50 years old starting to exercise, trying to get those six pack and, and you know, and, 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 and doing exercise and getting a better guy? What do you think? You know, well, I'm falling down another goal. I sat here, I'm strapping myself down at the edge of my seat, ready, you know, for him to announce something like that. But then, lo and behold, he came to me and he said, what did I, I think I'm going to, I think when I look into this room, it's not playing wine. I think I'm going to become a Muslim. I said, what? <laughs> you know, over my dead body, okay? <laughs> That's what I mean, an intelligent dude, you know? So I said, and so, I said, and then so, I mean, well, you know, he actually went or rolled all the way to Empire, took the Shahada, and then um, I said, well, no way, I'm going to read the translation of Quran myself, because, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm, in my, I'm, I'm still comfortably okay here. I mean, I'm not going to be inferior to him. The competition arose in me, and I said, I'm going to read the translation of Quran too, and I'm going to debunk it for you, and I'm going to prove to you, which is absolutely wrong, and just like going off the deep end here. So then I, I myself, start to read the translation of Quran. And, you know, I mean, a lot of stuff is jarring and, 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 and all that. Um, but, and, but what I appreciate was the timelessness in the Quran. And it read a little bit more like the Old Testament to me when I first read it, rather than the New Testament. So, and then I read it, and then, and then you know, I said, well, you know, this is like kind of nice. I mean, it's really not really different from the Buddhist lifestyle that when I was growing up in Vietnam, even though I was Catholic, I was, you know, I mean, around me is Buddhism. Buddhists took up about 80% of the population, so I'm, you know, I, I kind of see how serious Buddhists live, and I think, well, you know, the way of life that, that, that Islam calls you to is really not different from it, and it's really a certain, almost identical to Christianity, which I was used to, minus the Trinity notion. And so since I was never really, you know, that attached to the Trinity notion, and here just like a little bit, you know, like a clarifying message for me, and then there's a whole lot of science, 
uh, stuff in the Quran, but as a scientific person, as a physician, um, you know, I had to say, well, you know, if, 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 if I'm going to deny evidence-based, you know, then, then I'm no longer what I am, and I'm basically a science-oriented person. So, so to summarize, you know, the Quran for me, um, it would be like that if I'm going along following a will uh, of my parents, a photocopy with all kinds of commentaries, you know, on the side or whatever, um, um, and then all of a sudden one day, like two, three years later, somebody produced a real, a authentic copy of the will uh, that hasn't been altered. And you know, I'd be crazy to say, no, I'm going to stick to the photocopy alter version and not follow this one. So the Quran, for me, the, the, the transition from the Bible to the Quran is really that way for me. It's like, it's like, oh, okay, so now I'm exposed to just a more authentic copy. And, and I think that's probably just the gist of why I um, embrace Islam. Other than that, the theology and everything, and the theology is basically like Christianity minus Trinity, as I mentioned to you, and the way of life that, that Islam emphasizes very much as the Buddhist way of life. And, um, you know, there's a saying in Vietnamese, and I don't see any channel on Vietnamese person in here. <coughs> there's a term, uh, there's a saying in Vietnamese, it's called Dem Dạ Vam Dali. That means that you bring the, the, the essence of religion is you bring um, religion into your life. And, and I think that that's uh, one of the main attractions about Islam is it does emphasize that the way Buddhism does. When I was a uh, Christian, I have to admit that there was a lot more compartmentalization, you know, as far as like, you know, being on a certain night in the church on Sunday, and then, uh, and then out of that, you just kind of like go on and live your life. And then, then I, it's very easy for me as a Catholic before to slip into secular humanism and spiritual relativism because all around me, that's what it was. You know, we, we claim that we have scripture, but we don't really uh, follow it to the teeth, but we figure, well, you know, as long as I love you, you love me, as long as everything is done un under the, the name of Jesus and under the name of love, and everything goes. And, and I think sometimes that can be dangerous and because it can kind of cr cross boundary and, and you can start making your own rules. So the Quran for me is a lot simpler to follow because now I have a set of blueprint. Um, I think there may be a number of non-Muslims, so I'm going to go ahead and venture out. And this is not about trying to convert anybody or proselytizing. I'm horrible with that. But I'm just going to tell you uh, about my own experience and, that, and my own, own observation. And, and, and that is, uh, if you notice through, through our scriptures, um, the, there's a lot of prophets of God, you know, starting with Abraham and David and Jacob, and there's a whole slew of them. But there's certainly certain messenger, important prophet, important message that came with actual message, like Moses came with the Ten Commandments and the Torah. And Jesus came with the, uh, the, the, the scripture, the New Testament, as we know. And the prophet Muhammad, peace to God, came with the Quran. So if we think about, you know, uh, maybe, I mean, I, I, I rely on Dr. Burns to correct me. But I'm just speculating that I think that as human beings, we kind of weak and we kind of need miracles around us to impress us. So when, when, when Moses came along, as you notice, at that time, the pharaohs in that culture, the, the miracles seemed to be very culture dependent, what, what impressed people the most. With Moses, most of the, the, the miracle was about magic, because magicians were hot in those days. You know, if you're a great magician, you're number one. So, you know, look at all the, 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 the miracles performed by Moses. It's all about magic. You know, the snakes, uh, the, 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 the batons or whatever, the staff becomes snakes, and his staff, you know, became the biggest snake, eating all the other snakes, and then splitting the Red Sea and all that stuff. It's all magic. Look at Jesus. <coughs> Most of his miracles are about healing. You know, the blind became a seer, and the dead, you know, woke up. And, and if you look at the, I'm not trying to erase this here, but if you look at the Jewish culture, I mean, I haven't met too many Jewish family who don't only have a doctor or one one of their children to be a doctor. You know, even that survived them today. So that is the culture. If you look at the culture of Arabia, Dr. Arabia would be much more eloquent than this than I am. And I think over there, even today, we're going to stop, um, you know, landscape of the sun and the moon and the sand. I mean, literature and poetry is revered, and, and even today. So the Quran is the miracle itself, uh, because it's, it's revealed by Prophet Muhammad, um, and he's, a, he's, he's illiterate. And up until this day, there has not been a non-human being who can, who can imitate even one short line in the Quran. So I feel fortunate that today I can't see the miracles of Moses. I cannot touch the, the miracles of Jesus. But actually, there is a Quran that I can learn. And uh, 
uh, that, you know, can be put up in any way. Thank you very much for listening.
when the focus is examined, when we look at the way that women uh, come up in discussions about Islam, we find that women's lives tend to be of interest only in relation to a few specific topics, namely oppression, violence, and resistance. Now, there are others, but these are kind of what I would say argue are some of the dominant themes, right? So to illustrate just a few cases of how these themes play out, often, if not always together, let's consider some of the following. So, child brides. Now, what I'll do is I'm going I'm to make escape here and go to the internet just to give you a quick sense. Here's a National Geographic um, special that was done on child brides in Yemen, the secret world of child brides, because everything's always a secret when it comes to Muslim women's lives. They're not knowable. Um, they're always sort of shrouded and, and, and inaccessible in some ways. And so in this piece, there's a, there's a quote that comes from this piece that says, Mujud Ali, who is one of the, who's one of the child brides, when she was 10, she fled her abusive, much older husband, took a taxi to the courthouse in Sana'a, Yemen. The girl's courageous act and the landmark legal battle that ensued turned her into an international heroine for women's rights. Now divorced, she is back home with her family and attending school again. Now, I'm not trying to trivialize her experiences or the experiences of any of these young women, but here we have oppression, we have violence and resistance all packed into one. We've got the, she was 10 years old and married, she's oppressed. We've got the abusive husband, hence violence. And then we've got turned into an international heroine. We've got the resistance. She becomes a, a, a sort of um, trumpet for women's rights against this issue, okay? Um, now, another one. This one's very interesting. I don't know how many of you have seen this, Lifting the Veil. This is on National Public Radio. I happen to work very much well, and she's a good friend of mine, with Asma Uddin. She's the chief editor-in-chief of altmuslima.com. Um, but this whole series of Lifting the Veil, it's 12 Muslim women who discuss what it means to wear the headscarf and why they decided to stop wearing it in public. Many now wear it only during prayers. Now, I think that's a very interesting topic and one that I think is well done here. However, what I find interesting is I haven't found the comparable um, representation of why women choose to wear hijab. Um, so, and, and I think this neatly ties into this constant, this, these themes about oppression, that taking this off is essentially a symbolic form of liberation in some ways. Um, another story, um, which would be Fox, well, New York Times, and there, there are too many to go. Here's behind the veil. You've got your image of the, the woman shrouded, and if you go to the multimedia slideshow, You've got the veil and its challenges, again, constantly reinforcing this, this, the interest in the veiled woman. And there are always these themes about freedom and liberation and these sorts of things worked into that. OK, then you, um, we've also got a Fox News story. I'm, I'm not putting it up here. It's, um, it's, it's about Muslim women. I'll just read you a small, a small fragment of what it says. But while there are plenty of comforts from their home countries, Muslim women say that they're constantly balancing, cut, balancing their lives between the freedoms they have in Western culture and the restrictions they face from religious and societal pressure. They worry about whether they're following the habits of a good Muslim woman. Again, this tension, freedom in Western culture, um, restrictions they face from religious and societal pressures. Because Western society has no pressures and has no questions of freedom, but Islam does, and Muslim societies do, right? This is the kind of motif. Um, so that's coming, and then of course we've got the champion of women's rights, and I say that tongue in cheek, I am Hirsi Ali, with the caged virgin, metaphor of domination, you know, Lila Bologna talked about her books, this is, you know, the cover of her, another white woman who's veiled, um, an, an interesting person to think about. Now, I'm not trying to under, undermine or underplay the suffering of Muslim women, but what I'm pointing to is this constant framework for thinking about what gender in Islam, and especially when it's basically about women. Um, so all of the examples point to the way gender appears for the U.S. consumer audience as a story about women linked to oppression, linked to violence, and linked to resistance. We know little about the lives of women, actually, in any other context. We don't know about happy marriages in the Muslim world, because those can't exist. Women's work lives, what's it like to be a woman in the workforce? Uh, we wouldn't know, because nobody asks. Experiences of motherhood, we wouldn't know. Sisterhood, wives, how about an unmarried single woman? Um, what, it, what they wear to parties, where they party, how they party. You know, I lived in Jordan for two years, and in the summertime was the booming season of weddings, you know, public weddings on the streets with people dancing and everything. You would never know this is going on. 
Because the only time gender and you know equals women comes into the picture, it has to be a tragedy. It can't be a positive story because it, I don't know why. <laughs> but it can't be. I don't know why. So this so this is the story generally I'm painting um, about women in Islam and the, the idea that gender is equals women in Islam. Um, Okay, now let's talk about men. So Muslim men rarely actually enter the title of news or um, articles or even academic works. In fact, it, I, I'm, there, there are two books now. One is called Islamic Masculinities and another one by an anthropologist, Marsha Enhorn, who's doing research called The New Arab Man and talking about um, reproductive issues, uh, about artificial insemination. Really interesting work on Muslim men. Very limited, very few works like this. So you rarely find men enter the titles of news reports, academic works um, related to gender. In fact, only recently in the academic world have you found Muslim men as sort of a title to appear in any of the works. When men do appear, it's usually in, in two particular ways. The first is what I call the implied Muslim oppressor. So in most of the accounts that discuss women's oppression, violence against women and or their resistance, men emerge as the implied um, reason for a woman's suffering. Okay. Men are the implied older, abusive, perverted Muslim husbands of child brides. Men are the implied violent husbands and fathers that murder their daughters as honor killings. Men are the implied authorities, meaning they're the fathers, they're the husbands, they're the government officials that force the hijab on women. Men are the implied beneficiaries of all that women suffer throughout the Muslim world. Uh, a more recent example, which I talked about in my class, was this, um, I, this, this apparent Egyptian law. A law that would allow a Muslim man to have sex with his wife six hours after she died. Right? Well, the interesting thing was this was a lie. This was a fabrication produced by an Egyptian blogger trying to discredit the Muslim Brotherhood. And fortunately, Newsweek was kind enough to report that. But it circulated widely so much so that one of my students in my class presented to me saying, hey, look at this. And I thought this was, a, you know, in an academic sense, a beautiful articulation of what I'm talking about. Because here it is. It's so much so that men are oppressors that they still have control over women's bodies even when they die. They even still they have access to sexual control even after the woman is dead. And I thought that the, why was this so believable is what Newsweek asked, and I think it's a completely valid question. And the reason it's so believable in this case for me is because it was an implied Muslim oppressor. Why wouldn't you believe it? What else do we know about Muslim men such that it can enable a different viewpoint? about what a Muslim man would be. We don't have to question the assumption that a Muslim man would want to have sex with a dead wife. Good God, you know? But we don't have to, because, because it's, just, it's just so obvious that it's another extension of the oppression and the violence that men enact upon women's lives and bodies. Um, now, that's the first way. The second way is the Muslim man, what I call Muslim man is terrorist. And this is um, a representation that's not disconnected from gender, I would argue. Um, it's, it, it's still part of the game. So Muslim men appear as the Taliban, as Hamas. They appear as anonymous jihadists waving guns or militants. Men also appear burning flags. They're screaming at cameras holding shocking posters with comments about death to America and other statements of protest. We see men overwhelmingly represented in connection basically to violence and to extremism, to anger and to oppression. Has anyone ever heard of Muslim Rage Boy? This funny little thing on YouTube, it's kind of funny. It's a mockery of the way that this, this character of this Muslim, um, angry Muslim. Um, I think these depictions make it easy for us to accept what I call the, the implied Muslim oppressor. He's violent, he's angry, he's militant. Why wouldn't he be directing his anger and his violence and his militancy towards his wife, daughters, and other women in society? As Mona Tahawi's piece, which is very popular right now, Why Do They Hate Us, that's the title. Well, the they is obvious. They hate us, the Arab in particular, the Muslim man, right? Because in the subtext of Oriental discourse, it's always Arab and Muslim conflated. So the Arab man um, is, is the one who's, who's being asked why hating, because why else? Could, what else can we ask the Muslim man if all we ever see is that he's enacting these kinds of violence, okay? So those are the two brief kind of um, pictures I want to paint here about um, the way gender appears in discussions in dominant US discourse. Well, what do Muslims say about gender? Well, before talking a bit about um, other ways we can see gender that are, I think are more productive, I want to highlight how the monologues related to the preceding points and offer a few thoughts about how we can think about gender differently. Now, in the monologues, I think we saw some of the, what I would call the political effects of the dominant discourse in the United States. So, for example, we find both women and men thinking about how women are treated by Muslim men, 
how men see non-Muslim women and how that relates to Muslim women, how men are seen as terrorists and oppressors, as one was very articulately put, how women struggle with the issue of modesty in the US. Okay? These are some of the issues visible within the monologues that point to the struggle, um, to, to the struggle the dominant discourse on gender has basically imposed upon Muslims, particularly us living within the United States. So Muslims, we have to think about gender in ways that addresses the dominant representations about gender. Muslims, we carry a burden then, right? That goes beyond those that what we ourselves may think about gender, but actually has to take stock account of what others think about gender for us. So let me give you two personal examples that are anecdotal, but I do have a sense of the general picture that, that these speak to, um, to give you a sense of how the dominant discourse actually plays out, its political effects in our lives. And these are very simple, but very important examples to me. So my wife wears headscarf. She's um, hijab, as she's called, right? And during a trip to Miami, we were seeing my family in Miami, and we're at the port of Miami. We're sending off some of my family members on a cruise. Um, and this guy who's helping me with the luggage, my wife's not around, he tells me, you're a lucky man. Muslim women are such good, obedient wives. They serve their husbands really well. Now, I'm not going to fault him. I'm not going to be angry with him. What else did he have to go on? He took one look at my wife and made a very fair assumption based on the information that's available. You get the impression of a quiet, submissive, oppressed, dominated wife. Easy for a guy to say, lucky you, you've got that wife. Who doesn't want that, I guess, right? Um, and again, simplifying the Muslim man, because why, I mean, wouldn't I want more than some quiet, obedient wife? No, of course not. That's what I want. I'm a Muslim man. That's what you want. Um, another small anecdote, you know, uh, and this happens quite often. Whenever I'm walking with the stroller with the kids, or what, actually my wife Fatima, she's walking with the kids, and she has the, 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 the kid in the stroller, um, and so, sometimes we'll, she'll have both of them. And it's not because we're planning it that way, it's kind of a constant shuffle. If you've got children, you know what I'm talking about. The things are moving, it's kind of a chaos universe. But I'm very much aware of when I'm not pushing the stroller. Because I'm thinking, somebody's looking at me, and they might be going, why is she doing all the work? And I'm not kidding. And I go to the stroller, and I act out this kind of Michel Foucaultian disciplinary act that you've studied as well. You know, I'm self-disciplining myself according, according to what I'm aware is this dominant discourse that matters and acts upon me, has political effects upon me, such that I have to calculate and strategize at times. Um, and I wish, you know, sometimes it's easier to say I don't care. Other times it's not, and, I'll, and, I'm, and I'm readily going to admit that. So all of this to say is that the way gender works within the discourse of the U.S. translates into the lives of both Muslims and non-Muslims in very damaging ways. It offers a deprived perspective, to say the least, for non-Muslims to see Muslims, and it places on Muslims an unfair burden of proof. We have to prove we're not what you might think we are. We know what you might think we are, and you have good reason to think that because that's all you would know about us. So what do we do differently? So some new directions here. Well, gender doesn't have to be this way. There are other more productive ways of thinking about gender and thinking about Muslims that doesn't walk us into some of these traps that I just described. Now, to illustrate, I'm going to use the classic example of the hijab. Forgive me. I have to do it because it's, um, it's one that needs to be talked a little bit about. So let's start with the hijab, since that's a big one that people have on their minds all the time. So the hijab for Muslim women means a variety of things. Okay? Uh, that's a simple anthropological truism, I would say. It just means a lot of things. It's not just the headscarf, but um, I'm going to limit my discussion to the headscarf because hijab is actually much more than that for any Muslim would, would know this. But I'm going to limit it to the headscarf because that's typically what gets discussed in terms of about hijab. So the first point I want to make is that any discussion of the headscarf has to be um, has to understand that for Muslim women, it's what, I, what, what William James, a philosopher, called a living and momentous option. Okay, so here I'm borrowing the language of William James. A living option means that the option presented appeals to the individual's beliefs. It has particular importance for the individual who's presented with that option. So for example, if I say to a non-Muslim, be a Shia or be a Sunni, it's a pretty meaningless option. It's a dead option. It's not living for you. It has no real bearing for you, right? This option for all purposes is dead. It matters little to you and it doesn't resonate with any of your beliefs, so why would you make it? give it any second thought. But if I say to some Americans who are non-Muslims, be a Christian or an atheist, this might have much greater relevance to your beliefs. Okay? And it'll thus be a living option because the choice is, meant, is going to make a, a matter in your life in some way, such that not making it would, be, um, would affect your lives in important ways. Now, it's, there's also a momentous option. And a momentous option means that the option's unique. 
which means that the stakes of the option are significant and the decision sometimes is near irreversible. So someone who all their life has been wishing to go to see the Amazon River is given all of a sudden this opportunity to go to see the Amazon River as part of some expedition, okay? That's a momentous option. That might never happen again, okay? And so it, has, it matters greatly to the individual whether they do it or whether they don't do it, okay? Um, matters much less, we would say, than somebody who's, than that same person being presented with an opportunity to see a movie with a friend, which could be done at another time. So I say this um, to say that understanding the hijab, the headscarf, as the option of wearing a headscarf or not, I would argue is both a living and momentous option for, for people, for women. Now, as an anthropologist interested in the lives of Muslims, I won't say that the hijab is determined by any one factor, okay? For example, if you were an Algerian woman resisting French colonialism, the hijab was partially worn out of resistance to the cultural imperialism of the French. It may have had religious importance to you in some ways, but that was a more complex experience of why a woman was wearing the hijab in, the, in that time. Um, or, if you're in Iran today, you may wear the hijab as a result of state regulations, also some sense of religious piety. You may turn it back a little bit and show some hair as resistance to the state, but it's always a much more complex thing. It's not just one, um, one thing that explains the hijab. So the reasons for wearing the hijab, in a sense, are what I'm saying is that they can't be assumed, they have to be explained or examined and within a context. But I will say that per William James, the hijab is in fact a living and momentous option for Muslim women for two particular reasons. The first reason is that there is an established tra tradition that whatever the debates are about, um, wherever the debates land on that tradition, one can't ignore it, okay? One cannot ignore that tradition. There's a historical and a scholarly tradition, and a Muslim woman has, the, it's a momentous option for her in the sense that the tradition matters for Muslims, and one has to engage it. Now, I'm not normatively saying whether you should or whether you shouldn't, but I'm simply saying to understand why a woman wears the hijab, you have to understand that it's momentous in that way. It comes in the context of an important and significant tradition that matters. Second, and relatedly, the hijab is a question related to a number of ideas. So it's related often to ideas about modesty, about respect, about sexuality, about objectification, but it's always one focused on a woman's relationship to God, or simply put as an act of piety. So we can discuss how it's an act of piety and or why, but the basic point is that the hijab is a headscarf is, and more is related to the crafting of a pious self, linked to some kind of tradition. So in, in Lita's monologue, she considers how God perceives her, how her actions are linked to her relationship with God, and how important it is to her to know how her, how her life facilitates her connection to God, right? Well, we would know this from much of the literature on the hijab, because the emphasis is always on whether it means a woman is free or not. So the framework for gender in Muslims' lives, though, I think, if you want to talk about gender and you want to talk about the hijab, you have to take account of the relationship between piety and God. If, it wants, if, this, if you want to access at least some of the more powerful, I would say, explanatory aspects of what has been grossly reduced to nothing more than a discussion about freedom or oppression. Now, there's hijab for men that I want to talk a little bit about. So, interestingly enough, men rarely factor into conversations about freedom and or oppression, unless, of course, as the implied free man who's oppressing um, his wife as a husband or oppressing his sister as a brother or a father or a dictator or whatever it may be. But men also engage in a practice of hijab, not headscarf, like for women, and it's a living option, it's a momentous option for men, and at some basic level it's also oriented towards the creation of a pious self that's connected to God. So here I'll give you an example from my own life to kind of make some sense of this. When I became Muslim, the first route that I took for coming to move to Islam was through the Nation of Islam, much like Malcolm X. Now, how many of you know anything about how the Nation of Islam guys look? How do they look? They know? Can you tell me? What do they wear? Suits and a bow tie. So I wore a suit and a bow tie. <laughs> Well, it wasn't just wearing a suit and bow tie, right? It was, it was characterized and taught, in a sense, as a self-transformative way of transforming yourself into a more dignified human being. We can talk anthropologically all day about the techniques for doing that, but nonetheless, that's what it was. It was a project of self-cultivation. Change, change your image. Stand upright. A whole, set, a, whole soul, a whole entire kind of constellation of acts that were meant to facilitate a kind of pious experience and one that connected you more to God. Well, I did that. And I also learned from the Nation of Islam 
um, as a Muslim, that there were different ways of conducting relationships with women. Now, I was, this didn't happen in a vacuum. I was still part of the society and world I lived in. But it was something that was a part of, of the experience of my becoming Muslim and in the context of the nation of Islam. Now, some might see this as oppressive, although you would never know because no one ever asks if men are oppressed, right? Um, some might see this as limiting, but whatever anyone says about it, it was a meaningful project for me, and I engaged in it, in it willingly, with a desire to develop myself at the time in a particular way, according to ideas that were not necessarily those that I grew up with. You know, uh, they told us not to wear shorts, so I wouldn't wear shorts. If I had shorts, if you did wear shorts, you had to come below the knees. You know, I saw these as important things in the, in the construction of a pious self that mattered to me. You would never know this if all you're thinking about is whether I'm free or not, but you wouldn't ask that because the only person you're interested in is free is a Muslim woman to begin with, right? Uh, so few authors and reporters actually have ever explored these issues for men. There's very little work right now concerned with how men engage in practices oriented towards norms of modesty, respect, and for their connection with God. Um, and of course, these issues are no different from women's. The factors in a man's life are as complex as any others in a woman's life. So you have to take an understanding of gender in its context to make sense. So for example, I know many young Muslim men who believe that wearing the long white garment called the thobe, right, um, is an intimate part of emulating the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him's example, okay? Now I could just say that that's a religious act and it very well may be on some level, but these are Muslim men I know from the in the United States, from the United States, who live in Michigan, and that means that there are, uh, there's a context for making sense of this, this act for an individual male, right? So that means that there are questions I might want to ask if I want to talk about gender in Islam and men that point to their community life, who their peers are, the feelings they have about commodity name brand clothing, like wearing, whether you're wearing Levi's or Tommy Hilfiger, their identities as Muslims in a non-Muslim society. In this sense, the thobe is a living and momentous option because there's a tradition that makes it one, but at the same time it's framed and structured by all of the options in the, in the world that they're a part of. And all of these things have to be considered when somebody's thinking how an individual Muslim man decides how to practice um, a hijab in a way that condu is conducive to a pious self. So, conclusion. So, by discussing the hijab both for men and women, what I'd ultimately like to point to is what I and many anthropologists and Muslims believe needs to be done in order to think differently about gender today. So, I'll outline this simply in just a few points, and I only have about four minutes. So, first, there's an urgent need to stop thinking about gender in ways that pits women against men, in ways that represents women exclusively in terms of suffering, and ways that I say essentialize men. So gender is first of all, the first one, putting women against men, gender is always a project between women and men. You cannot reduce gender to just women, you cannot reduce gender to just men. Um, there's a broad literature that supports this. You need to understand gender as an interactional sphere of activity, okay? So we need to see women and men in their relations through institutions like family, like marriage, like school, like work, like leisure, all of these contexts in which gender actually takes place and it happens in between men and women. Gender is also a project that's not just about women or men suffering. Now, men and women do suffer in the Muslim world, like any other person, and they suffer greatly at times. But Muslims' lives are not only relevant because they suffer. Where is the celebration and beauty of Muslim life in contemporary accounts? Why do we know so little about Muslim men and women who are transforming their societies in important ways? Gender is as much about the creation of a happy family as it is about the creation of an unhappy one. Gender is as much about teen brides as it is about single men searching for a potential spouse through the internet. Gender is as much about the headscarf as it is about the Versace scarves worn by Saudi American Saudi women. Okay, and so again, we're, we're trying to move beyond the kind of dominant ways of thinking about gender as only suffering. And finally, we need gender discourse to stop essentializing men. By this I mean that we need to understand the lives of Muslim men a lot more. We simply don't know enough. It's not enough to assume that men are simple oppressors or terrorists in Muslim society. They're also the victims of oppression and they're also the victims of terrorism. So remember that Mohammed uh, Wazizi, the young man in Tunisia who set himself on fire and was charged with, was, was sort of hailed as igniting the, the Arab uprisings, he was slapped by a female police officer in a country where at the time the headscarf was banned. Now that's a complex picture. And gender there is happening in a number of ways. Not only that, he was slapped because he was resisting something related to economic issues in Tunisia. So gender is about the economy. Gender is about authority. Gender is about power. It's about relationships between men. It's relationships between men. You would never know this if we just continue on the track that we're currently on. 
We need to know more about people like Muhammad, this young man, uh, uh, because if we don't, we're not really doing justice to our searches for gender. So one things we, a few things we could start doing would be to start looking at women's lives in relation to other women. We can start looking at women's lives in relation to older and younger women because age matters, class matters, race matters. We can start looking at men's relationships to other men and to, again, younger men, class, racial, ethnic, whatever. Um, and we need to look at women and men's lives together. How men and women interact, struggle together as a family, struggle together as friends, as spouses, just as much as we're interested in how they struggle against one another. Um, so one of the things I was doing when we got Muslim up was putting together this Muslim man project, was to try and produce some articles about Muslim men's lives and experiences because we don't know so, we know so little about Muslim men's lives. So these things, need, these efforts need to be um, replicated. Uh, we need to know also that gender is much more than the headscarf. I only got about a minute, another minute left. Um, yeah, so we need to, and, and so I'll just close. So we need to get beyond this idea that, that, that gender is just about the headscarf, okay? And we need to move on to seeing literally beyond the veil, because it seems that the only veil we keep seeing is the one we keep putting up in front of ourselves when we want to look at gender. Move the veil and let's start thinking more broadly, more sophisticatedly, and more productively about what uh, gender in Islam actually is. Thank you. That's a very good and complex question. I mean, in terms of, I just talked in my identities class briefly in one day worth of lecture about the racialization of Arabs, and in particular and Muslims as well. And in the initial waves of migration that took place in the 19th century from Arab migrants, many of them were Christian. And when they came here, the legal debates on citizenship were, are they white or not? And so Arabs who passed as white, in some cases they were recognized as white, were offered citizenship, in other cases they weren't, because they were deemed non-white because of their heritage. They were called Syrians and Turks at the time because it was the Ottoman Empire and they weren't recognized actually as Arabs. Time goes on, various things happen, racialization shifts, Arabs starts to be conflated with Muslims, um, and, uh, and in what, what we call the racialization of Arabs in this case is that there is a discourse that makes Arab equal to Muslim and Muslim equal to other. In the same way that you would think of white and black as other, you would think white and Arab, Muslim, Western, Eastern kind of othering. And at that point, it complicates the nature of mosques. So the early Arab migrants who were Christian had no problem fitting into civil society because when they set up a church, it might have been the Lebanese Maronite church, but it was still church. Whereas when mosques started to come up and there was this, dom this racialization taking place, especially in the 1960s, then you start to have a different attitude. It's no longer a temple, it's a mosque. And it's a mosque that, that feeds into the othering of these different kinds of people, and it creates all sorts of forms of discrimination. Government targeting all the way back to the Nixon administration of Muslims. Yeah, um, and 
There was a famous case that just ended up after 20 years about the, the California Eight or something. I think there were like seven Palestinians and one Ethiopian. For 20 years, this case dragged on, finally to drop the charges. But dating way back to, to a, a long before 9-11. And so there has been very little, well, we're starting to actually see a, a more normalization right now. I mean right now. So right in, in pop culture, which is a good measure of what's going on uh, in some cases, we're starting to see the normalization of a Muslim character as a spot character placed within TV shows. That's actually an important achievement. They're not being racialized as white, and I don't know what the verdict is about what, they're being, what their role is, but they're there. And it's not necessarily the role we would have expected five years ago. So there's something changing. That's my long, short answer. I'll go here and then I'll cut back. Speaking of gender, I wanted to ask, how does the Muslim community go about denouncing certain groups that, you know, do something in the name of Islam that's not Islam, for example? Uh, Nora Allen had an issue with the, I think, three weeks ago by her father. Mm -hmm. He ran her over. And um, a couple of months ago, um, an African father killed his two dogs with, along with his first so I'm wondering how, how does the community go about denouncing it? Because I don't really hear like a protest or you know anything going on about these communities. You don't hear protests coming from within these communities? Yeah, yeah, within, within, the, within the Muslim That's a tricky subject because, well, let me ask you, do you want to answer that? <laughs> contribute to that and I'll, I'll back off. Uh, <laughs> okay. It's not fair to have her here. Um, I think that one of the reason for that is because we are not living in an Islamic state with a central voice uh, that you know you can just send, send out something about everything that has to do with religion or but but I think that within local communities um, if maybe one of the maybe one of the problems is that there's not enough ways on to that Muslim community where the event took place and the uh, whether it's law enforcement or other, uh, uh, how you call it, establishment that can get the news out. Uh, but I think that now, the, the, you know, the reason we hear about that is through the news through the internet. And um, there are a number of organizations that are also starting to speak out whenever there, is, there are events like that. Um, and especially when they have to do with uh, uh, civil uh, uh, events, with, you know, their organization like CARE, Council on American Islam Relations. Right. And then there is also the national organization, uh, ISMA. I mean, I'll give you a defensive answer and then I'll give you a, a, a different kind of answer. My defensive answer is do Muslims have to protest everything Muslims do? Because when the Catholic Church comes out with these scandals about child rape, there is outrage in the Catholic world, I'm sure of it. I don't have to see it. I know that Catholics are not supportive of this. Um, but I don't see a lot of wide-scale protest within Catholic churches denouncing the hiding of these sorts of things and the contributions that officials have created. Um, and nobody, as far as I can tell, could be wrong, but I don't see a great deal of discussion asking, you know, are all Catholics pedophile? Because obviously they're not. Why would you ask that? Uh, but when these things happen in a Muslim community, it's difficult because there's a sense that if we don't say something, it, well, if we say something, we're owning it. And I, I would say that it would be helpful if within that community maybe something comes out, some projects to work to, to maybe not denounce it, but, but to do something to prevent and work with people so that these things, sorts of things don't happen. And another thing I would say is why doesn't the media ask what a Muslim feels like? But then again, if they're asking a Muslim what they feel like, it's sort of that uh, I'm a Muslim, like why should I account for anything that these guys did in September 11th, right? I'm not Saudi Arabian. I, I have no relationship to those guys. They did something, yeah, they're, they, they claim they're Muslims, and they'll claim to be Muslims, maybe they're Muslims, whatever. But why should I be held accountable for those people's actions? I'm implicating myself in the discourse that's destroying my, my, the, the image of my community because I have to own it all. And then come out and basically I start to sound like a cliche. We denounce this, this is not Islam. And people get tired of hearing that. So I, that's my kind of defensive answer. But there are some pro, there are proactive things that can be done, like any other community can do to deal with all the problems that communities have, whether it's honor killing or gang violence or you name it. Every community is struggling with something. 
Muslims can always do more to improve the quality of life for the members of their community. I mean, because I know, I mean, I'm not just saying all Catholics, every religion too, I'm saying a lot of people, they don't protest or denounce the things that they should be denouncing, but instead get riled up and angry over tiny things, which is the important things that, you know, the man kills his own daughter or, you know, the priest um, molests children, like no one, no one talks about these important things, but instead get offended if someone criticizes the religion, you know, it gets a group of people riled up and angry. I'm just saying, like, in that case, you know, I, I mean, Ram Malkin, not here. I mean, no one was talking about her. Well, I mean, it, these are really like, complex things, you know, I mean, the, the, the South Park issue, and then these two guys, or three guys, or whatever, that had the rep website that ran saying that the South Park people should be killed or something, that was picked up by the media, made a very important issue, people start to talk about it, and then it's like, why are you talking about South Park and not talking about women's issues or men's issues in particular places in the Muslim world or something, you know? It's a really complex issue, and it's not it's not reducible, but I hear what you're saying, that sometimes it seems that Muslims are caught up on, on cer certain peculiar things. Not um, only Muslims, I mean, Christians too, and yeah. Jews. I mean, I'm not just trying to say one. Yeah, it's a complex issue. I, I mean, that, that's actually really something that's analyzed and examined and, and offer an answer that I can't do. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I was a little curious. Uh, if I was Muslim, you know, a woman converts to Christianity, does that person put his life on the line? That depends who you ask. <laughs> yeah. So, well, I know, I, and I'm going to say it depends on who you ask and where it happens. I'm not going to, you know, I, I don't make the laws in certain places, and in some places it could be, it could be a, a major issue. And there are other places where it's not a major issue, and there are some Muslims who feel very passionately about that, especially in a time like now, and other places where they don't feel it's a, it's a passionate issue. So, you know, I, I hate to give you the kind of that kind of an answer, but it really does depend on you ask, because I don't think that there is one sort of standard way of doing it. You, sh Sharia law, which is diverse in many schools, uh, it's an interpretive practice, right? And if you have the Sharia, uh, if you have a, a knowledgeable scholar of the Sharia dealing with that issue, I'll give you a, a simple, a much more contextual answer. So for our class right now in the Middle East, we're, we're talking about the Fatwa Councils in Egypt at Al-Azhar University. And part of the role of the Fatwa Council member is, these people come to this, this mufti and they ask him for advice on something. Potentially, I'm thinking of converting to Christianity. One of the things that the Fatwa Council member has to do is assess the person's life story in some ways. So it's not just a scholarly textual thing, although it has to do with that. So there's going to be some interpretive work and looking at the tradition of knowledge that speaks to these issues and what's been done in the past. At the same time, the Federal Council member is going to assess the story of these people, why they're making that decision, what, what are the pressures, and then the Federal will be issued based on a number of factors. And that's why I have to say it depends on who you ask because it's no, there's no one simple answer. I'm sure there's somebody who will tell you, no, they must be killed within three days or something like this. I'm not going to, yeah, they, that person exists. But there are plenty of people who are going to say something quite, quite different. I wish I could give you a more black and white answer, but I just move all that way. Maybe there is also a broader principle in the line that is, I think there's a notion in Islam that you cannot execute a Sharia. Uh, Islamic law is the absence of justice and peace. Uh, you know, I think the thing is kind of bullshit about it.
allows that, that this is not the province of, of between us, it's between God and his servants. So whatever a person chooses, God further says in that verse that the truth is clear from error. So we're not to force anybody to be Muslim or Christian or Jew. We're not to, we leave it to, we leave it up to the person's own conscience. A person's a Muslim because they consciously decide from their own understanding, their own knowledge, their own devotion, their own connection with God, that they to surrender to God. Not because someone's putting a gun to their head or forcing them this way or that way. It's totally, it's hands off. And even a knowledgeable person to leave it, leave it up to the person that when they decide what they want to be, what they want to follow, that's what they mean God. According to the principle that God gives in the Quran, and that's the top principle, and everything trickles down from, uh, from that. There's a methodology in Islamic law that has to be followed by the highest of jurors, and none of us get in the way of, of what God has commanded. Does that make sense? Yeah, that was in the Quran, and more people read it, and a lot of people would be abused and taken advantage of women and anything. Well, that's the problem. A lot of people are making their own conjecture, and the Quran clearly says that uh, that. Muslim or the person seeking God should seek al yaqeen al yaqeen is that which you're certain about, rather than dhan. Dhan means conjecture, your own idea, your perception, what's popular, what's the latest, what's the latest buzz in the world. No, you should follow what is certain. And in, in the beginning of the Quran, you just that. Um, so right. we're just about out of time, so we're going to take two more questions from the panelists, and if you guys want to continue. So I would add, yeah, I think that's a really valid point. I would add that for, for new directions on gender, and we're starting, there's one book on, I think, and I forget what the title is, that's looking at homosexual Muslim men in the Middle East. Um, so it is, a, it, it's, it is a trajectory that needs to start, and that's part of gender as well. And not just though discrimination, right? We, we don't want to reduce the representations of communities to nothing but what they suffer, right? It's this over-victimization. I do think we need to talk about discrimination, and I think that's a completely valid area of study, but I also think if that's all we talk about, what richness are we actually giving to the lives of people who, you know, um, who, who don't just experience oppression and suffering? Um, and, and again, it, it, if we do it that way, we get around this kind of tendency to always define Islam in relation to something terrible. Um, which I'm, you know, yeah. So I, I, I agree, and I endorse that, and think that that should be part of the new trajectory. I mean, we can count, we can go on to a, a lot of things that need to be included in a new perspective um, and tra track for gender. Well, that's the de well. That would be the debate to analyze in terms of gender, because the, the fact is that there, this is a contentious issue, and so rather than reducing it to not to to something to one particular thing, again, as an anthropologist, I'm more interested in understanding what the complexities of the debates are. Um, but I, you know, it can happen however it happens, but it has to happen, and it has to, the discussion has to. Take place. Let us end here. Um, How much did their religion play? I have no way of measuring that, honestly. I think that's a good question because everybody's asking about, you know, is there going to be an Islamic takeover of the Arab uprisings? Um, you know, I can tell you that, for example, 
this is because this is again the difficulty. To what extent does religion provide the explanation for all the things that you're seeing happening? Just because a Muslim does something, does that mean that he's doing it because he's Muslim? So a large part of the Egyptian uprising was um, a result of labor organizations that have a long history of labor organizing. It was part of the labor movement. Those were, many of them were Muslims involved in the labor movement. Did they do it because they're Muslims? Did they do it because they're labor? Because they want to put food on the table? Let's have that conversation. Let's do the research that doesn't reduce it all to saying Muslim takeover, as if Muslim is the motivating force for all things, or Islam is, and ask those questions and figure that out. But I have no way of measuring that. I am sure it has certainly opened up opportunities for Muslim political activists to begin to assert certain kinds of politics in the public space. Granted, um, but I don't know that um, we, you know, I don't know how to measure the extent to which religion matters for all of it. It seems that it's not the explanatory factor. No, until until they start to fear the Muslim Brotherhood, right. and then they started to talk about it. So. Wait, actually, I think we only have two questions, and I want to honor that. So we're free to talk.